Um, how did you feel about the backlash for the album Catharsis? <laughs> uh, you know, the record is what it was in that time. And all of that, you know, I thought that there was some good stuff on that record. I thought that I, I enjoyed a lot of the stuff that I wrote. Welcome to Rock Talks. Today we're talking to Phil Demol, guitar player of Violence and former Machine Head. We discuss everything about the new Violence EP, Let the World Burn, his whole story with the band of Rob Flynn, what's like to be a filling guitarist for Slayer, Overkill and Lamb of God, and more. If you like this interview, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, and share the video with all your friends. Also, very important, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell. By the way, if you see a little advertisement at the beginning, in the middle, or at the end of the video, please do not skip it. By doing that, you're helping me a lot. Come on, guys, it's just a few seconds of your life, and it will really make a difference for me. I'm counting on all of you. Enjoy the interview. Hello, Phil. How are you, man? Thank you so much for your time. Welcome to Rock Talks. Rock Talks. That's right. Good to be here, man. How are you? Doing great. Doing great. Looking forward to this interview, actually. All right. Right. So let's start talking about the new violence uh, record, Let the World Burn. It's actually an EP. So my first question is, uh, was it recording during the pandemic or these were songs that you do, had uh, before the pandemic? No, we had actually started writing. Uh, we did the 70,000 tons of metal cruise and I think that was in January. Maybe it was February, I think it was in January of 2020. So we started writing on that cruise and then uh in march everything went down so this was done pretty much in the pandemic we didn't have too much before mm -hmm. so was it was uh, a brand new experience for you was it more difficult more uncomfortable maybe in some way no because we were we weren't really sheltering in place we were <laughs> we were we were going to the jam room you know we were uh um yeah we were just doing it <laughs> and uh, so it was it was it was fine it was normal we were you know um writing is you know me and me and perry for the most part sean was there for for some of it and uh uh yeah it's just perry and i hammering it out mm -hmm. and why an ep and not a whole album and an ep well you know it, we hadn't been we've been together about a year doing shows again together and uh, as we started writing the material um was just kind of not knowing not knowing if how we felt about each other or how we, it would work writing music so we just i just wanted to to throw out the idea of hey let's do three maybe four songs let's see you know if we can write together and keep those expectations pretty low as to where not all the pressure of like oh, well fuck we got to come up with 10 11 songs now and you know just just see if we can hammer out three or four songs um it was going to be four el gato negro was the last song we wrote and then i had the the riffs for uh i started riffing on the upon their cross the you know the the, the, the grindy parts of that song and I didn't think it was really a violence tune, but uh, Perry and Sean, especially, was like, hey, that's killer. Let's, you know, let me, before you, you know, use it for something else or whatever, let me write, let me write something over it. And he did. He came back with something fantastic, man. And, and it was, uh, you know, it's, it's the song that's different than the others on the, the EP, but it's still brutally heavy and still violence. Mm -hmm. All right. And before, it, before that, you put out a, a cover, right? California Uber Rail, something like that. Uber Alice, yeah. Yeah. Uber Alice, yeah. It's it's a, a that Kennedy's Kennedy's cover, correct? It is, yes. And why did you choose that song to cover? You know, we were 
we were in the midst of kind of writing, but we wanted to, to release something to do kind of a video. And it was in the middle of the pandemic. We filmed it at our bar. You know, everybody's wearing the suits and the masks and everything. And, right. uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, we wanted to have just something out. We just, you know, we, we, it was a song that Sean wanted to play live. And uh, so we, we had learned it. It's a cool, it was a cool thing. Uh, we thought it was a cool time to put that song out and just decided to we didn't want to wait until we had a song written and you know recorded you know christian recorded us and produced that himself right in our jam room and we want we like the raw feel of it so we just want to have something to have fun and put out mm -hmm. people yeah. are pissed people <laughs> are pissed why are they doing a cover for their you know because <laughs> it's what we want to do man well it's a it's a it's a great song it's really catchy Right, so it was a, a smart decision, in my opinion. All right, Pierre. Huh? Ah, what? Yes, thank you. Ah, no, you're welcome. So uh, I wanted to ask you the the video and the lyrics of that cover are somehow related to the pandemic, to the all the, the restrictions. I don't think so. You know, I don't think that that was. You know, everybody was saying, "Oh, they put out their anti-max." video and anti this and it's just like it really wasn't man mm -hmm. you know everybody in the video i think they were wearing masks they're playing wearing full body suits it wasn't yeah, like yeah. A, there was no message like that and everybody has their own opinions on on everything but we weren't really reflecting them and you know we wrote that you know there's the part where we're taking the medication and all that and exactly. everybody's all that's anti-vaccine that's anti-vaccine and you know what we did that before there was any talk of vaccines. We did that video before there was any, any vax, no vax, anything. It was, you know, I had the idea to have, you know, Jello Biafra was going to be in the video. And oh. he, he did it because it was, we were quarantined and everything. But, you know, and then I had the idea of having like a nurse ratchet from One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, you know, saying, take your med medication. That whole medication time thing is taken from one flew over the cuckoo's nest. It's got nothing to do with the vaccines at all. <laughs> so, you know, that's my wife. I'm spitting water in my wife's face. You know? <laughs> not only you, the whole band. <laughs> no, not everybody spitting their face, but. <laughs> that's funny. Well, that scene was kind of like an unfortunate coincidence, maybe. Yeah, it was, man. There was no talk about vaccines at that point. None. Yeah, this was released like a year and a half ago, I think. I think so, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we filmed it in July. I think it was the 4th of July. I think it was on the 4th of July that we filmed it at uh, I own a bar in town here. And uh, I think we barbecued or whatever, but it was just like there was no, there was no vaccine controversy or or talk of any of that because anybody i mean even in the beginning it was just like oh the only ones that are you know the fortunate are going to get the the vaccine will be nobody was anyways i'm belaboring this way too much yeah next question, right. next question. <laughs> <laughs> i agree so i i want to talk about the this lineup it's kind of like an all-star lineup for violence because you got people from fear factory christian who used to be the, the bass player in the, that band during the 90s and early 2000s, and a guitar player as well there for the archetype and transgression era. All right. And, and you have- great, the, great guitar player too. Oh yeah, amazing. Archetype is a, a, it's one of my favorite albums ever. It's a great record. Yeah. And also you have a Bobby Gustafsson from Overkill, you know, from the 80s era of the, of the band. Mm -hmm. So, how did you put all this together? Because nowadays, like I said, violence is like an old star thrash metal band. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that, you know, towards the end of Dean being in the band, he wasn't able to make it to some of the shows. So we were going to have Christian fill in for him. And then Dean just couldn't commit to what we were. We were stepping things up and playing more often. And he wasn't able to be uh, present like we needed him. So Christian just kind of stepped into that spot. Bobby, same kind of deal. Ray wasn't going to be able to continue with us in the capacity that we needed. And uh, Bobby was a friend of Perry's. They played in some bands. You know, I think right after Perry quit Violence back in the early 90s, then him and Bobby started jamming together. So they've known each other for a long time. Mm. And uh, 
and so that was like a no-brainer you know bob's got the pedigree and both of them you know they've, yeah. they've got the experience they got the pedigree they've got the the chops they've got the professionalism they've got you know and they're awesome dudes they're you know great humans to boot so you know the people we want to hang out with and so it's both of them were really fortunate to have and be available to, to do this so bobby and christian are permanent members for violence yes yep all right all right so are there any touring plans already booked for this year we are going to do uh we're doing like a midwest little tour of the corner that band corner um playing a couple shows in or a show in chicago and we're doing uh, the oblivion fest in texas and we're doing maryland death fest in all right. maryland yeah. and uh doing a show in boston and new york and philly all within that week in, in may so where are you at mm -hmm. ah, where lima, are you at? lima peru south america lima peru okay so i think we're we're putting together a uh south america tour i think violence is going to be coming down to south america too mm. Around July, August, or the end of don't know. Don't know. I think September. There's some dates. I think one just got announced in Chile on uh, the second of September. Mm -hmm. uh, September Negro. I think is going on in Brazil. I think Violence is going to be playing that. All right. Sounds cool. Hopefully, you can make it to to Lima. Yeah. Hopefully. So, so far, some shows, some festivals here and there, but not a whole North American tour or a European tour. I don't think there's going to be like a month long tour with this band. Maybe, maybe not. It just depends on, um, I don't think, you know, everybody's in their, you know, mid fifties reaching sixties and, <laughs> you know, don't want to schlep around in a van for, you know, six weeks to a month, but if the right situation showed up, possibly. All right. All right. So are you planning to maybe start a, a new musical project to fulfill your agenda full time? <laughs> Yeah, I've uh, I've got a lot on my plate. There's a lot going on with me. I'm, um, you know, writing music here and there. Um, I fill in for you know for Lamb of God sometimes. Um, you know the so yeah. There's a lot going on. <laughs> so, Can you tell me a little bit more about this new project? Uh, I can. <laughs> <laughs> All right, all right. Maybe next time. That sounds yeah. promising. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Talk to you in a year and you'll know all about it. All right, all right. <laughs> so let's go way back to 1988, the Eternal Light Nightmare era. Yes. All right. So what's the craziest memory touring for that record back then, 88? Ah, oh, you know, we did the a tour with Testament on there on the New Order and through the states and that's pretty much the like the the biggest tour that we did and um we only did a handful of tours we toured with testament we toured with voivod we did a headline tour with defiance and that's it really so less than a year of touring for that yeah album. we did we did like a small east coast thing that only had a couple of shows in it so that's that's the extent of our touring you know and you know, touring with, uh, touring with Testament, and you know we had the the drums tied on top of the van. We had two <laughs> benches. There were seven of us in two benches in this van. We had all our luggage, all our gear in the van. It was just uh, just a van, fifteen passenger van. You know, no trailer, and uh, we lost a, a drum off the roof one and rainy going up to upstate New York. We lost a bass drum going up there. And, you know, it was, we were just it's 21 years old and, and just having fun, you know, out drinking every night and nothing too crazy. Sometimes it got crazy, but, you know, just enjoying, you know, all the, the fruits of being a kid and being on their first tour. That was a good time. Mm -hmm. And how do you explain that album uh, become a, like a legendary record around the fresh metal uh, circle, circles with that little touring? It's crazy, right? You know, it, there was a lot of a lot of buzz on the band, and I, we just never got it together touring wise. You know, we never made it over to Europe. We fired our management kind of early on in the uh, recording of. Uh, oppressing the masses and she was friends with everybody in the industry so we were kind of 
kind of blackballed because of that. And uh, so we just never, we never toured. Um, it's good that people remember the record and it may add that much of an impact. It's only seven songs, you know? So, I mean, this EP is only five. It's not that much shorter than Eternal Nightmare. So <laughs> yeah. if you think about it, so. So maybe you will work on, on, a, on an LP maybe next year for Violence? I don't think so. I'm not thinking that we'll do another EP. I want to do another EP, another four or five songs, mm -hmm. depending on, you know, and if they churn out and if we have more, then, you know, I'm certainly not going to stop it. But I don't want to, you know, these came out so good, I think, because we had the focus on all of them and, and mm -hmm. there wasn't anything getting lost. It was, you know, five songs in front of us that we filtered and went over so many times, every drum roll, every beat, every note, every, you know, solo, everything was gone over so much. And I think that all those songs benefited from that instead of, you know, having maybe not as much attention on if, if there's five more songs or whatever. So I, I just like that idea. Mm -hmm. Okay. On the album, Nothing to Gain, the band started to sound a bit more groovy, right? A little bit more uh, slow, but still heavy. Uh, mm -hmm. do, you, do you believe if Rob Flynn would stay in the band, violence would start to sound more like early Machine Head? Maybe? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, writing that record and in the time, that's what was happening, you know, it was 90, 93, 92, maybe 91 when we started writing that. Um, yeah, I think it was 91 because the Black the Black album just came out and uh, but I don't know uh, writing that record was we were just writing not for ourselves and kind of writing for what the label wanted and um, you know he was writing I believe he was writing songs while he was in violence towards the end but we had already written that record two years previous you know mm -hmm. and uh i don't know if we would have maybe we might have <laughs> i'm not sure i was a big fan after he left of you know the demos and watching watching what machine head was doing i was a huge fan i loved it you know um started the, the band i started from violence was basically violence without sean was torque and you know we pattern you know a little bit a lot after you know what machine head was doing so it's mm -hmm. really inf influential on me at that time oh yeah yeah you know a lot of people especially like really old school metal heads they say all the time oh the 90s were really terrible for metal because of nirvana blah 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 but i actually believe that the 90s were great for metal because of bands like machine head fear factory yeah. pantera yeah. <laughs> you know, helmet, trade them yeah. more. Sepultura, prong. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. what's your take on that uh, statement about the noise? Same. I feel the same as you. I thought that there was, you know, some great metal at that time. Some of my favorite, some of my favorite records are from Vulgar. You know, Vulgar displays from there. Burn my eyes is from there. Cleansing from prong is from there. Uh, uh, Sepultura record. Um, KSAD is so fucking good, man. Um, that, that might be my favorite Sepultura record. So, I mean, all of this awesome things are happening. Even like the ministry records that were in the mid 90s were, were killer. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I don't you know. People don't really consider them metal, but you know. Really? Ooh. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know. People. People just, well, they're not really metal, but they're industrial. It's like, well, industrial is pretty fucking metal, man. <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> We're metal hits around the world. <laughs> the live one, is it, uh, the mind is a terrible thing to taste. Is that the live record? Yeah. I don't, I don't, but, the, but that era, the, the album that had the land of rape and honey with stigmata on it, uh, pretty electronic, but still pretty, uh, you know, the helmet. Oh yeah, there's some heavy stuff then. The meantime, great. Album. Yeah, All right. And what about the <clears throat> the second uh, half of the '90s? You know, the core and Deftones era, Static X. Um, you know, I was married at the time, and uh, once once Torque had kind of ended, I took 
you know, two or three, maybe a couple of years away from, from music. I was, was married, was working, uh, got into uh, running basketball hoops in my neighborhood, playing in city leagues, uh, snowboarding, got into snowboarding a lot. Uh, I was golfing a lot, you know, and there was just, I, I didn't really know a lot about that era, you know, a lot of, of what was happening in the late nineties too much until like 99 got back into it a little bit. But from that point, from like 97, 96 to 99, I was listening to, you know, Incubus and Stabbing Westward and, you know, whatever was on the radio, you know, it's such a weird time for metal. I was just listening to whatever was kind of on the radio as I was commuting to work. And you disconnected then, from the metal scene for a while. Yeah, for a bit. And as when I first joined Machine Head in 2002, 2003, uh, there was all these bands that, you know, I didn't know of that they kind of schooled me on there. Like, oh yeah, and this is this band and this is blah, 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 blah. And, you know, and because I liked like Quicksand and oh, yeah. uh, uh, some of some bands like that were kind of on my radar. Monster, Monster Voodoo Machine I liked. And, you know, I followed the big ones. I followed like Fear Factory and, and what those guys were doing but you know that the machine head dudes would kind of like show me all this stuff that had been happening when i was you know off snowboarding and golfing and, <laughs> and all these things so it's kind of removed from it for a minute all right all right so considering that you briefly played with slayer overkill and also lamb of god as a feeling guitarist yeah um, which of these bands or set list were more challenging for you to learn Oh, you know, man, they're all hard and and because the, they're all so different, you know, they're all different. The the Slayer stuff just difficult because it's like learning chat, learning Chinese because of their, their writing. Every, every band, every songwriter has his own language and what they write in and their riffs and where they are and how to decipher them. And, you know, the Carrie stuff and the Hanneman stuff is so, you know, outside the box and you know difficult in that sense but the circumstances in which i was thrust into you know last show with machine head on saturday getting a text from carrie on sunday going and clearing out all my machine head gear on monday being on a flight on tuesday out to germany to join slayer i didn't have any chance to really learn anything so i'm learning on the flight over the entire flight <laughs> over there taking notes i had a legal pad with all these notes on it for all these Slayer songs, you know, and I've got this weird memory thing to where if I map something out, I'm pretty good at remembering that, you know, in the, uh, the machine head uh, meet and greets, I try to remember everybody's name, you know, as they came through. And then when we went to go take pictures, I tried it and there was 30 people, you know, every day. So I get 27, 28, 29 people out of 30. Correct. You know, just a weird quirky, memory thing so the slayer thing was just like such a short amount of time to learn these fucking tunes lamb of god i had more time to do it mm. um but and fortunately out of all three bands uh mark and willie do a lot of playthroughs on youtube mm -hmm. you know they've gone through and here's this riff and here's this riff slow and here's you know so a lot of the songs i got straight from them on the video <laughs> you know sh showing how they play it you know, I only went, I only went to Willie with two songs that I wanted him to play through because there's harmonies. I couldn't tell who who was doing which harmony. So there's only two parts that I needed to get from Willie. The rest I was able to figure out. The Overkill songs are, and they're all three different tunings. You know, Machine Head or uh, Slayer is a half step down. You know, uh, Overkill is E standard, mm -hmm. and so Lamb of God is like E standard with a drop B they're drop D. So they're drop D. So they're all these different fucking tunings. Mm -hmm. And learning, you know, the overkill stuff was more kind of old school. And they have a lot of Sabbathy parts. So I would say yeah. that maybe the uh the overkill set was the easiest. But just in the sense, you know, structure wise, maybe not so much. Their their formula is pretty similar, but they especially their new stuff, so they'll do the kind of metal stuff in the front and then they'll drop into a bow down bow, 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 you know into a sabbath part yeah, yeah, and those yeah. are kind of easier to remember their counts are more on the fours and kind of easy so uh toss up between lamb of god and slayer but I, i'm gonna go with slayer being 
been the most difficult. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can play some overkill covers with violence now that Bobby is in the band. <laughs> you know, I don't, yeah, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if Sean's going to sing Blitz. I don't think that you'll, I don't think that you'll hear Sean Killian being able to do a, a Blitz, and I don't think Blitz would be able to do a Killian for that matter either. But. Yeah, Blitz is one. But I did hit up, I did hit up, hit up Bobby about some parts, you know, how mm. I noticed that the Dave, was playing stuff a little bit different than Bobby did. So I just wanted to make sure how Bobby wrote it. Yeah, the old, the old school way, right? Yeah. All right. Uh, considering Dave McLean rejoined Sacred Reich and after, and you went back to violence, is it safe to say that Machine Head made you miss old school thrash? Can you repeat that? I'm sorry. Oh, <laughs> considering Dave McLean rejoined Sacred Reich and you rejoined uh, Violence, is it safe to say that Machine Head made you miss the old school thrash metal? I don't think so. I don't. I don't think that you know. It's just like no. I don't feel that way. I was able to. I didn't write thrash, but I was able to listen to it if I wanted to. It wasn't like I, you know. I don't think so. It's just opportunities were there once we both we happened to quit at the same time those bands happened to get together right you know they were we were available sean you know sean came and said hey let's do this so it's just kind of a coincidental thing but i was ready to you know i was ready to write i was ready to write some thrash for sure mm -hmm. so it's, it was kind of like a weird coincidence for both yeah of them. yeah all right and um, how did you feel about the backlash for the album Catharsis? <laughs> uh, you know, the record is what it was in that time. And all of that, you know, I thought that there was some good stuff on that record. I thought that I, I enjoyed a lot of the stuff that I wrote. Heavy Lies the Crown was, I fucking love the riffs that I did for that. Um, there's a lot of a music. Hope it gets help. I wrote, you know, I love, I love the music for that. A lot of good moments on that record, man. And you know, sometimes it just doesn't happen, and it just didn't for me on that record, you know. But, but I love Bloodstone and Diamonds. I love the Blackening. I love the, you know, Unto the Locust. I love Through the Ashes of Empires. And what about the the records before you joined, the ones that you are really into new metal? uh i like i, I love burn my eyes i i think uh the more things change is fucking awesome there's some yeah. really cool parts on that i love uh a lot of what logan does super out of the box stuff oh yeah um so i love i love those two records that he's on man i like the burning red too a lot there's some you know cool stuff on that supercharger i wasn't really you know it had some moments you know, it's probably it's probably my least favorite Machine Head record. You know, even more so than Catharsis. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it has Bulldozer on it, so how you know that's a crushing <laughs> song. Um, and what that's all they that's all they did, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah they don't have one out yet. Yeah, I remember back in '01 when Supercharger was released. Uh, people didn't like that, that that album that much, right? right? So maybe Supercharger was the the catharsis of the early two thousands for Machine Head. <laughs> maybe, yeah, yeah, maybe. I mean, that's I don't know. I don't know how much I want to. You know, it's been I'm almost been out of the band four years now, and um, you know, the dude. How long is it? He started the band in ninety two. Yeah, it's, been 30, it's been 30 years, man. It's been 30 years and still going so strong. You know, how can I, I'm not gonna, I can't, I, there's things that I, that I don't like that I was in the band for, but I mean, the dude is an amazing musician, writes, you know, he knows how to write a song, uh, such an underrated guitar player, fuck, such a good guitar player. And, uh, and he's, he's got that pan still clicking 30 years later, man. You know, <laughs> can't hate on that. I won't. All right. That's great. 
So you you don't stay in contact with uh, Rob. I no. Don't. But it's great in a way that you don't want to talk trash about the guy. So kudos for that. Yeah, you know, and everything that I've that I've said before, I felt like because I wasn't able to do press for a while, that it needed to be like my side of the story, or it needed to be there was parts that needed to be answered. There was questions that needed to be answered. You know, I don't think that I've really slammed him. I've told the truth about some stuff, but it hasn't been at all. He sucks, and he, you know, I'm not gonna do that because it's just not fucking true. Um, so I'm, you know, it's time to move on, you know. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's right, I agree. All right, let's talk about the blackening for a little while. I remember when that album came out, everybody was like, oh my God, this is the best machine head album ever, blah, blah, blah. And some people were saying, this is like the master of puppets for machine head. <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree? I can't, you know, I can't ever say that. No, I won't, I won't say that this is our, this is our ride the lightning. This is our, you know, <laughs> this is our kill them all. This is, no, because that, nobody has had a, their ride the lightning. Nobody's had their master of puppets. Yeah. Nobody has. I, I, you can't compare them that way. You know, it's machine heads, the blackening. It's their, I think it's probably the most complete record. I don't know if it's my favorite record, but I think it's the most complete in a sense and you know and crowning you know success or what i don't know about album sales or anything but that's when we did our biggest tours when the the biggest buzz was and um i am extremely proud of that record and my country my contributions to them too so i mean i think it's coming up on how long has it been 2007 oh, so seven. yeah coming coming close to 15 15, 15 years. years yeah through the end of the next month so yeah i mean i'm proud of that yeah a lot of those songs don't happen without my contributions farewell to arms doesn't happen you know beautiful morning doesn't happen uh slanderous doesn't happen without what i now i lay thee down that, you know that's half the record and none of those songs happen without me you know without those initial ideas and bringing them forward so really proud of that yeah, yeah, I feel like that album was like the perfect album for that time for 07, right? Yeah, in a way, yeah, it was, yeah, musically, especially. Yeah, if you like this interview, please give me a thumbs up, leave a comment, and share the video with all your friends. Also, very important, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell.